Good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure to see so many gathered together for this meeting. The first gathering of uh, people interested in system dynamics was 57 years ago. And there were 16 people. <laughs> now, the attendance here is about 30 times as many. 30 times in 50 years. <clears throat> Another 50 years, that's a multiple of 30 times, <laughs> would mean, I think, a gathering of about 14,000 people. <laughs> and the question is, what would they be doing then? Will they be 14,000 more people doing what we're doing now? Or will they be discussing victories in system dynamics that we are only now hoping for, wishing for, thinking might be possible. <clears throat> Some people, I think, feel that we've arrived, that we go on doing what we're doing. But that's far from true. We may possibly be as far along as the end of the beginning. <laughs> but we're certainly nowhere near the beginning of the end. There are many mountains ahead that can be scaled, and I'll just mention two or three of them. Probably our most complex system is the human body. It is driven by endless numbers of feedback loops, about which I think we know at this stage relatively little. And if we judge from the nature of complex systems and how people react to them, <clears throat> we're entitled to assume that a lot of the treat treatments in medicine may be counterproductive, a lot are not, are not useful, and we're going to have to have a dynamic analysis of the behavior of the human body in order to have the next great breakthrough. And this is because we are dealing with nonlinear systems. Nonlinear systems are really unexplored. There was a paper many years ago called Nonlinearity, and the author suggested that if you would imagine being in a small tent, Everything that can be dealt with linear mathematics is inside the tent, and everything outside is the nonlinear world. And if you could put your hand through a slit in a tent and feel around, that's all we know about the nonlinear world. Of course, system dynamics are, for the most part, entirely nonlinear, but we don't know very much about the nature of that nonlinearity, except by just trial and error, which may be the only way, uh, but we should have some attempt to understand the very nature of nonlinearity and see where it leads. In management education, many here are in management education, management education in the universities has often been looked down upon by other departments as being just a trade school, and that is right. Compare management with aeronautical engineering. Aeronautical engineering departments train people to design airplanes, and the pilots who run them are trained in trade schools. Managers, I suggest, are the pilots that are running systems that have been designed by chance by mistakes and corrections, uh, by committees. And an airplane designed that way would, of course, never fly. We should give a broad view to the whole field of differential equations. Differential equations are used now in the physical sciences and the social sciences when you want to deal with change. And yet, I think differential equations have gone, done a great disservice to understanding. 
Mathematicians have had some difficulty defining a derivative, and there's a reason for that. There is no such thing. Nowhere in the physical world, nowhere in the social world, is a derivative actually taken. The real world only integrates. And of course, in system dynamics, we deal with dynamics through integrations. And differential equations is doing a, quite a lot of harm. It produces a reverse sense of causality in many people. I have had MIT students argue with me that the water flows out of the faucet because the water in the glass is rising. That's what the differential <laughs> equation says. <laughs> differential equation says the flow is a derivative of the water level. That places the water level as the driving force uh, for the flow. I've had uh, two doctoral students from our Department of Computer Science come over. They've had all the mathematics, all the differential equations, all of the theory of solid state physics, and they've built probably a two-stock two model, two-stock model of what is going on in the, in the electron cloud at the, at the interface of a transistor. They said it was the first time they ever understood what was happening. And so, you might take as one goal, driving differential equations out of business. <laughs> It'll, it will take time. <laughs> uh, now we might look at the future. People wonder what the future holds. People try to guess, they try to predict, but for the most part they simply are overrun by the future. They are caught unexpectedly by it. There is a different approach to the future, and that is designing the future. If you design the systems in the world to run properly, you have some idea what the future is going to be. If you design them to run badly, you do not know what the future will hold. And so there is room, actually, for a concept of designing, designing the future. That sounds rather grandiose, but I think it's one of the directions we're going. Now, I want to comment on dynamic system dynamics in K-12 education. There's a lot of work going on there, but I don't sense that the society has a great deal of interest or a great deal of work behind that movement. And let me point out to you that the future of the field depends on K-12 education. If you want to change, let us say, the course of a country, take Greece, for example. It's in bankruptcy. It's causing a turmoil, throughout, th turmoil all through Europe. A very simple model tells you what happened, what was going to happen. And they failed to take action in time, time in time being probably two or three decades ago, because they had a public that had no grasp of the nature of dynamic systems. It will do you no good to model what should be done in government. It will do you no good to convince the authorities in government to agree with your model because nothing will happen. It will only happen if you have a public that can support the rather counterintuitive ideas that modeling will produce. <clears throat> and to get that public, I think it's absolutely essential to have a kindergarten through 12th grade education that is far, far more than anything exists at the present time. In K-12 education, there are many projects, many, many class exercises, many teachers that are doing something, but they're all essentially at the introductory level, and there is no cumulative program in K-12 that runs from kindergarten 
through 12th grade, 12th grade to leave people with a deeply embedded sense of the characteristics of complex systems. One of those characteristics, we, I, I've, been, uh, <clears throat> I've identified five or six is one of the things I've written, but one is that a policy that is good in the short run is almost always bad in the long run. And that's the reason that Greece is in trouble, it's the reason Puerto Rico is in trouble, it's the reason that Chicago is in trouble, and it's, a Chicago, and it's the reason that other countries, including the United States and European countries, may be in trouble in the future. Uh, because the short run, you borrow money to give current benefits to people, and you run up a big debt, and eventually that system comes to an end. And it's only through a public understanding of some of the fundamental natures of systems, very deeply embedded. You will not get it from a book. You will not get it from seeing a few models. You will only get it by having it driven home for 12 years. And it will take the form of models. It'll take the form of looking around the your city, for example, you will read the press to look for models. You will read history to look for those same dynamic behaviors until it is just so fundamentally built into you that it's one of the first things you think of when government decisions are coming along. Uh, with that, I think I will bid you good night and leave the future for you to develop.